another episode of Dr. Phil here. Now, we got a guest that's been on the show before. His name is Taylor. You you might remember this young man because the last time he was on my show, it was because he slapped his mama for not making him pizza rolls. Now, Taylor's back, and Taylor's back because his mom said, I, I can't care for this young man anymore. Send him over to the grandparents and come to find out Taylor has now thrown his grandmama down the stairs for not using his correct pronouns. Taylor, what is going on? Why are you back here today? Well, she tried to murder me by getting me non-gluten-free pizza rolls this time, and she served them to me by giving me by saying the wrong pronouns. Okay, uh, Taylor, I'm clear. I told her <laughs> ten times, I am alien self and. Hercules, oh, and she Taylor, did not say Taylor, the right Taylor, Taylor, pronouns. Taylor. I'm going to have to cut you off there. I'm not getting with this whole new stuff. Um, now, you've thrown your grandma down the stairs. You know what that means, young man? Do you know? That's repercussions for the violence of words that she committed uh, no, against me. Young man, I'm going to have to cut you off again. It means you're going to the ranch. And, and ranch, I mean dude ranch. I, I mean he, him pronouns. That's the ranch you're going to, okay? Can I at least submit my dietary restrictions before I go? End of the show. There's no hope for this young man. Hopefully we never see him back. <laughs> Guys... Uh, welcome to Unapologetic Live. Give me the Oscar now. I want it now. <laughs> uh, the Academy Award goes to. Uh, today we're going to be reacting to an episode of Dr. Phil where it is boomers versus Gen Z. And they're talking about things like sensitivity, cancel culture, the economy. And we're going to give you our hot take on the matter. Let's get into it. All right, guys, welcome to the show. Happy Friday. Hope you guys are having a fantastic time. Let me know in the chat down below what your plans are for the weekend. My plan is to chill, as always. Taylor, you got any fun plans for the weekend? I have an engagement party on the beach and then another pumpkin carving engagement on uh, Saturday night engagement, but, you know, party um, <laughs> on Saturday night. Um, so I've got a very busy weekend ahead. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be funny. It's like put the put the ring in the bottom of the pumpkin, pull it out. All pulpy. Also. Yeah, I don't know if, if you, you want to speak. Uh, in the producer's bay, we got Cam. Hi, Cam. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Which Cam is the Cam, the Cam Higby that you're also going to see in the Discord server if you guys are logged in there. If you're not, lame, get in, loser. We're going to Discord. Uh, the link is down below in the description. Go there, fill out a ticket, and in the ticket, send us your email. Just send us a short little message with your email, and we'll put you in the Discord server. That's all it takes. We already have over, like, 1,200, yeah. yeah. Over 1,000 people chilling in the Discord. I'm sure some of them might be doing a live watch party right now. So if you guys go log in, you'll be able to catch the next one when we do a live. So again, link is in the description down below. Now let's get to this Dr. Phil episode and see who's getting sent to the ranch. This is what I'm sad about, you know. When I got the offer to be on Dr. Phil, I thought... I, this is going to be interesting. This is going to be some hot TV. And I got there and it was actually just like chill, civil discussion, which is cool. You know, we're all into that. But nobody got sent to the ranch. Yeah. It was just like the, the Winona speech last week. It was like we wanted the, you know, raging purple haired protesters to be screaming at you. And right. we kind of just got some passive aggressive chalk messages, which we will show you next week. But yes, we um, will. <laughs> yeah, but a little disappointing, but still fun. Still yeah. much fun was had. So, so this episode is Boomers versus Zoomers. You guys have all heard that. Uh, he even references the fact that OK Boomer is a very frequently used phrase on the internet. And uh, the title is an old age debate. So let's get into it, watch it, see what we got to say. Today on an all new Dr. Phil. We're dealing with a generation gap. Do you know what this is? I know you have to spin each dial and then spin it back. It's boomers. We are on TikTok, <laughs> a younger generation of people that are saying go back to Facebook. I was surprised we learned how to block people. So. <laughs> <laughs> She said, you're leaving us $31 trillion in debt. We will be paying off what you guys enjoyed for the rest of our life. Now, in the audience, we have baby boomers, Woo! age 58 to 76, and Gen Z, age 10 to 25-year-olds, sometimes referred to as Zoomers. Yay! So, boomers and Zoomers. <laughs> that was Thank you for explaining that, Dr. Phil. I love it. I absolutely love it. 50 years in between these two generations, there are so many publicized differences that the hashtag OKBoomer okay has been used over 3.7 billion times Dude. on social media to mock baby boomers. Now, Gen Z blames boomers for the current economic, political, and ecological climate. 
Now, that's a generalization. Not all people of that age do. On the other hand, a lot of baby boomers feel that the younger generation does not have a work ethic, is too sensitive, entitled, and sits on social media all day expecting to get everything handed to them. This Based. generation, <laughs> you talk about being coddled. What do you mean by that? Well, it's kind of funny. I'm not a big t fan of the title of my own book. I wanted to call it Disempowered because the argument we're making is that we have taught uh, the younger generation, particularly Gen Z, the mental mm -hmm. habits of anxious and depressed people. And therefore, we shouldn't actually be surprised that, that we have a genuine mental health crisis. I mean, we're talking about a 109% increase um, in suicide uh, for boys from 2010 to 20, 2020, and 134% increase in suicide between 2010 uh, and, and, and 2020 for girls. Dude, that's crazy. Those numbers are crazy. I know, Taylor, you, you've read the book, The Coddling of the American Mind. Mm -hmm. you, you own it. You're familiar with this guy, so you knew who he was as soon as, as, soon as you saw him. I haven't read the book yet, and I, I need to hop on it because the numbers that he presents and just his view of what's happening right now, particularly with this generation, is just astonishing. And he talks about this idea or this premise of teaching young kids the coping mechanisms or the reactionary mechanisms that people with depression and anxiety have. He doesn't really get the chance to, I think, uh, elaborate on what he means there, but I think escapism is probably a really big part of that. Uh, the social media searching for validation from other people is probably a really big part of that, and those seem to be present and uh, in, in presented in people with depression and anxiety as well, and our, our whole culture just feeds into that. Yeah, and it's this is interesting, and I'm glad they they open up with uh, Dr. Luke Lukianoff, I think it's yeah, Lukianoff, yeah, that, uh, because he he sets the table with facts, and anyone can can uh, throw their opinion. It's like throwing darts at a dartboard. Oh, what do you think? What do you, what do I think? But he's coming with like, no, here's what the data says, and here right. are the, there are negative psychological outcomes. Uh, the suicide rates, depression rates, things are are higher. Why is that? And he he's very much focused on it as from, from the perspective of a scientist, a social scientist at that. But um, anyway, I think it's very helpful to like deal with, separate fact from opinion and, and feeling, as we we love to say, um, and really. Because you can't really make progress if, if we're all just kind of like kicking perspectives back and forth and there's no facts for the matter to adjudicate well, who's in the right or who's in the wrong. Right. I mean, the, the numbers don't lie. Like, look at the amount of kids who are online compared to prior generations where they didn't have access to things like that. Look at the number of children I, identifying with uh, something outside of their, uh, their sex that they were born with. Look at mental health professionals and how much their business has just skyrocketed over the past few years. Look at how many people identify themselves with a certain mental health issue. I don't think that that's something that's necessarily up for debate, which is interesting because it's, we're going to get into a debate section of this of this show. And it's it just blows my mind how some people just want to reject what is just factually happening right in front of our faces. Yeah. It's amazing. And I th and to be clear, I actually think this is this is our fault. Um, mm -hmm. And I, one of the things we recommend in the book is the is learning from the wisdom of cognitive behavioral therapy, because the the dis dysfunctional way of thinking, where you exaggerate the dangers, when you catastrophize, when you overgeneralize, that's the, ha the that is a formula for an unhappy life. Dude catastrophizing a big word but all it means is that you are just making a mountain out of a molehill which is what is happening all the time in our generation it feels like every you you turn a corner and something's going to kill you it's unbelievable using somebody's wrong pronouns is now a, an act of violence it's a threat against somebody the climate change narrative and the climate change hysteria is quite literally cat catastrophic where people have climate anxiety now which is its own category of just feeling mm -hmm. depressed and and anxious people when it comes to race are so catastrophic about the state of america where we're living a lack of process through their eyes uh, the economy we could argue maybe that is a little catastrophic but <laughs> uh, that'll, that'll be something that we get to later. But every single thing we face in this world has somehow been dramatized yeah. into a world ending event. Yeah, and the, the catastrophization, if that's a word, yeah. goes hand in hand with the overgeneralization that he uh, that he alluded to. And mm -hmm. uh, like when you think about, OK, well, there's a, an overgeneralized narrative that, you know, women are paid, you know, what is it, 72 cents on the dollar for every right, dollar right. Men, men make. And that's an over that is OK, maybe a statistic that was right. In, but if you um, 
to parse that out and you look at the actual reasons for the differences, the assumption is, the overgeneralization is, it's 100% due to sexism and the patriarchy. Yep. When you look at it, into the choices women make, into the innate differences between men and women and how they go about their jobs, it, it's much more nuanced and sophisticated. And same thing with race narratives, same thing with these gender narratives. And so... Uh, the overgeneralization, you, you believe this sweepingly broad narrative about the climate or about mm -hmm. this, and, and it's then it's catastrophized. Oh, the world, you know, the world's going to end in, if we don't cut carbon emissions, blah, 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 blah. And then we don't have a nuanced approach to that. And then we stop producing oil and then we get into global food shortages and an economic meltdown it's just like crazy. because it's overgeneralization and catastrophization that makes you make bad decisions and leaves you vulnerable to uh, a life that doesn't work in the real world. We and, just... Yeah, we just have like the most radical responses to everything. Yeah. The most radical responses to everything. And it's so weird because when I was at Winona State, which we are going to make a video about and everything, uh, the, a few leftist students showed up and they wanted to ask questions. So they get in the line and basically they were trying to, in my opinion, drum up a, a gotcha moment on systemic racism where they found something that I didn't have a rebuttal for. And it's so interesting to even... To even assume, let's assume that I didn't have a rebuttal for it, and I said, you know what, that might be evidence of systemic racism, and you're absolutely right. Is that a moment you cheer on? Like, is that something awesome for you? Is that something you want to be right about? Which is what it feels like. It feels like we're living in a generation now where we view everything as a catastrophe, and we don't want it to be better. We don't want to accept that we're actually living in a better state than we are in. You know, when... When we get students who ask us questions like that and it's something that's debunkable or we can go, you know what, good news, that actually is not a problem or it's not the not the root of the problem. That should be a moment for you to be, oh, yeah, that's great. I'm so glad that I know that that's not a problem for me anymore <laughs> because it's been weighing me down mentally, physically. Mm -hmm. It's been causing a problem for me. But instead, they're upset to find out that it's not. Right. Like the focus is not on solving the actual or understanding the true nature of the problem and solving it. Right. The focus is on getting you to believe the narrative that I've bought into. And if mm -hmm. you don't believe it, then you're the enemy. And the problem is not the problem. The problem is the people who don't believe the narrative and ex and go along with, oh, the fact that we need to tear down the patriarchy yeah. or tear down white supremacy or uh, save the planet by cutting radically carb cu cutting carbon emissions and mm -hmm. eating bugs. It's like, unless you <laughs> accept all these narratives, um, you're you're the bad guy. And yep. the focus is not on understanding the nuance of the problem or checking your own reasoning. Does this even, does my approach to solving this even make sense? Yep. Will it even work? Will it cause other second order consequences, the unintended consequences? Um, no, it's none of that. It's just, you're the bad guy because you don't agree with me. And the goal is to get everybody to agree with me and silence anyone who dissents. A hundred percent. All the way, all the way. And they don't want to be wrong, which is so wild to me. Anyways, we're only two minutes in. Let's continue. Well, you, you say maybe we're to blame for this. I've got a big question. It is, are we, particularly in college, are we preparing this generation to face the real world? No, <laughs> maybe no, 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 we're not. I actually think we're, we're teaching them things that will make it much worse, that will increase suffering. In, in coddling in the American mind, we, we talk about their, it's as if we are teaching uh, a generation three great untruths. What doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Obviously mm. a, a dangerous thing to believe. Um, always trust your feelings, uh, which sounds nice, but it's completely wrong. And life is a battle between good people and evil people. And if you believe these three things, no wonder anxiety and depression is through. Dude, there's so much in what he <laughs> just said. There's so much in what he What doesn't kill you makes you weaker. So true. Mm -hmm. So true. We are told to attach ourselves to this idea of victimhood, that everything wrong that happens against you is something that you now wear forever and now need to talk about forever and advocate forever, trusting your feelings. It's like everybody reads a headline or a story or hears something or feels something and just goes with the immediate feeling that they have when they hear something. And if we all did that, the world would be in utter chaos. We'd be fighting and killing each other and crying in the streets, breaking up families, all of this different stuff if we just ran with the first emotion that we felt every single time we heard something. It's so important to just take a step back, take a deep breath, analyze why we felt the way we felt initially and then try to break it down from there but we don't even do that critical thinking and the last one it was uh, the world's divided into good people and evil people yep. and goes right back into what we we're talking about a second ago like the problem is not 
the problem. The problem is beating the people who are evil who don't agree with me. Yeah, a hundred percent. People are not good and evil. And I think this is a trap that people on all ends of the spectrum fall into. I see conservatives talk about how evil leftists are. I see leftists talk about how evil conservatives are. You can argue which one does more than the other, but the whole premise is wrong. You know, people are, are nuanced. They have just different layers to themselves. And most people are trying to do what they feel like is best. So it's not within your best interest to view people as evil. I know we did a little Reddit thread that this girl wrote about how she hates conservative men. And she had a friend who she had been speaking speaking to, to for a number of weeks and then found out that he was conservative and then just dropped him, didn't want to talk to him ever again, was disgusted, thought he was evil, all of these things. And the amount of energy it takes to feel that amount of hatred and to label somebody as evil like that in your heart and mind is just far more of a cost to you than it is to them. Yeah, exactly. You you pay the price for your own uh, inability to like relate to other human beings and, and extend them the benefit of the doubt. And I, I was talking to you, I, I experienced this recently. I'm in a church group and look, I go to a, a pretty big church out here in LA and there's a lot of people from a lot of walks of life that are there. And some of them are famous. Some of them are writers in Hollywood and do their own media ventures and podcasts. And I was talking to some of them and you know, they have one of them as a, as a black female writer in Hollywood. And the other, another one has a podcast called, oh, well, I'm not going to say what the name, yeah, but, yeah. but they, they talk as minorities about uh, him and some uh, minority friends about uh, movies and stuff from a minority perspective. And I'm like, oh, I could take that as a signal of like, oh, these people don't agree with me on politics and don't have, don't start from the same uh, worldview or the mm -hmm. same values or premises that I do as a conservative, but and they're liberal, so I'm not going to, you know, engage with them or I'm going to make assumptions about them that's going to keep me from connecting with them as human beings. But, right. you know, being in a different church setting, it wasn't about politics. It was about human beings and we talked and I feel like I have a much better understanding of where they're coming from and they're not these extremists in this case I mean there are extremists out there but it's I made the point I'm like it just goes to show you that not everyone that you see is like one of these teachers on libs of TikTok who's trying to you know groom kids or something just yep. because they happen to be on their side of the aisle from you on certain things and it's it makes you a better person a better critical thinker a better debater a better understander of your own beliefs and a better and more and someone who's more persuasive to the other side when you can actually understand and state their arguments as well as they can and you can put yourself in their shoes even if you disagree 100 percent. let's keep watching the roof yeah of course now brian why are you proud to be a gen zer um i feel like it's it's just a in my opinion and i don't want to offend any baby boomers but i like that for example if i want information right now i can go on my phone type in keywords and I'll find it in the snap of my fingers. I also feel like my generation is just- It's interesting because like, that is one of the benefits we have as being um, members of Gen Z, but nobody utilizes that benefit. You, you, we're never utilizing the benefit we have of literal computers in our pockets to do research in a moment's notice. Uh, even though that's sitting right in front of us, which is so wild. It's a little bit more accepting. I mean, I'm a gay man. I wear acrylic nails. <laughs> um, my generation, I don't really see them like scrutinizing me for my nails or anything. But like mm -hmm. um, some of my family members didn't really understand it at first. So I, I feel like maybe my generation is just a little bit more open and accepting. Really? It's a, it's a double-edged sword with that one, isn't it? Because it's like our Gen Z is more accepting of uh, identities, of stepping out of the bounds of traditional gender roles and just tradition in general, but it is completely unaccepting of the people who don't choose to do that and who are less comfortable with that or just uh, don't believe in, in those things. So it's it's... You know, you. What's the phrase? You can be so open-minded that your your brain I, falls dang. out. You know that was my I mean? one thing I was gonna say that Alma didn't say yet, and, then, and you took the took the line. So yes, it is a case of people people being so open-minded. The negative side of being yeah. overly accepting is that you accept bad ideas. Right. Your your mind is so open that uh, your your brain's fall out, and you let go of. Uh, good ideas because they're seen as traditional. And I think Brad makes that, if you didn't already, he makes that point in his video of uh, yeah. saying, you know, free speech was something that prior generations got right. Yeah. And Gen Z seems to be against that if it's, you know, being hateful or bigoted as they define it. But anyways, right. we'll, get, we'll get into that. Yeah, so it's like we're, we're, we're rejecting the old at our own expense. Uh, you don't have to reject everything that the people before you Which did. is also, by the way, not being open-minded. Yeah. If you're not open-minded to tr tradition, if you're not open-minded to, if you don't give it a fair shake, if you just dismiss it out of hand mm -hmm. as tra all traditionalism is our bigoted, ignorant ancestors and they don't know 
yeah. anything and they're just horrible people. It's kind of that same logic at play of like they're evil because yeah. there were sins committed uh, in the past where they did overextend their bounds. But so, but rather than picking apart what's worth keeping and what's not, we're just going to throw out the baby with the bathwater. We know better because everyone needs to be accepted now. All these new ideas and, and all the old ones need to be rejected. It's just such right. simplistic logic that's driving, I think, a lot of how Gen Z is going about things now. Which, to be fair is what every, every generation yeah. like complains about the generation after yeah. it and says like you're rejecting all you're rejecting everything you're bringing in this modernity you don't want to work as hard so i and i want to make sure that we always recognize that this is going to be a conversation that we're having in 30 years from now with gen z talking down to the next generation and saying you guys don't want to work and you're rejecting yeah. the things we built for you and all this stuff it always happens and it's just that that pendulum that continues to just swing and swing and swing uh although it does maybe feel like it's more dramatic now and it could be because we're living in it or it could be because it is uh, and well we'll get down to that i think so just a little just yeah. a, just a little. really more open and accepting why do you say that well i just think about when you guys were in high school how would a, a gay, an openly gay person have been treated compared mm -hmm. to our generation oh they wouldn't be openly gay well right, sure. <laughs> no, right. No, uh, and no, i think that there's a lot of progress uh, that has been made for the good and, and when boomers harken back to the good old days they often don't think about what the good old days were like for people who aren't like themselves. Who feels that, that Gen Z is more fragile than previous generations? Ra raise, raise your hand. hand. I'm Do you think they're more sensitive, more fragile? Phil. You said you think that your generation is much more open. Why are comedians not even willing to come on college campuses anymore because they're scared to death they're going to say something that offends? It's not. And I'll pause there. Um, obviously, this is not uh, Dr. Phil's problem, but it's not just comedians. We're talking scientists. We're talking researchers. We're talking conservative political thinkers. We're talking experts across the board who are either unwilling to go on college campuses because of the rejection that they're going to face or are just rejected by the college campus uh, for for whatever reason, for their background, for saying a certain certain word. Who did we have that was coming to speak he was going to i think mit or harvard don't quote me on this obviously to speak about space and they wouldn't allow him on the campus because in a separate talk he did or a tweet that he put out he said he didn't agree with the premise of diversity equity and inclusion it wasn't even the the subject matter of the speech that he was going to dr. give abbott. dr abbott so it wasn't even the subject matter of dr abbott's speech on the campus yet they wouldn't allow him because of comments he had made outside of that. And what you've done is exactly um, uh, what, the, what the expert who wrote Coddling of the American Mind talks about, is you're actually hindering students. You're actually not making them ready for the world. You're actually hindering their learning by not allowing these people to come and speak to them, even if they disagree. Just an impression. I mean, polling shows you what Generation Z thinks of concepts like free speech or freedom of expression, and they think things like hate speech need to be stopped. And that's one of the lessons they're learning wrong from history. There's a lot mm. that we can take from past generations that they actually got right. And free speech is definitely one of those things because pro progress. Uh, and he's right about this. I like that he's taking a clearly nuanced view of this because he's talking about, uh, you know, the older generation might not have treated gay people so great, so much so that they don't even feel comfortable coming out and being open about who they are. And that's wrong. But what's wrong now is that this new generation is rejecting everything from the older generation, even things like free speech, which is fundamental to a pluralistic society. Yes, that Gen Z cares about can only happen when you have free speech. What do you want to say? Well, I was just going to say, I think that there's a misconception that cancel culture or social repercussions mm -hmm. is something new. It's not. I mean, OK, let's pause because I recognize this girl. I know Cam recognizes this girl, <laughs> Victoria from from TikTok. Have you ever debated her? Um, yeah, I've debated Victoria several times. Uh -huh. um, I don't know. We don't, there's a little mutual respect, so we don't usually go like super hard, but I did watch sure. her debate Michael Knowles. I saw that too. She debated Michael Knowles on abortion. I don't think you saw that, Taylor. Mm -hmm. But I know her from just being, she's probably like one of, one of the very, probably the most well-known leftist on TikTok as far as defending her views, at least in the, in the female sphere of things. So I recognized her immediately and I had a feeling that she was probably going to be on the pro side of, of cancel culture and censorship and things like that. So I'm curious to hear what she has to say. I mean, we saw the chicks who were formerly known as the Dixie chicks. Um, I believe that they criticized the war on terror and there were parties to burn their CDs and radio stopped playing their music. Right. So see, social repercussions have always 
existed. I think that just as a generation, we're becoming more aware of how bigotry, even if it's in the form of a joke, really negatively impacts people. And so I think that while social repercussions are nothing new, what we penalize people for saying is changing. And I think that that's a positive thing. The stereotypes used in um, comedic stand-up is just simply just like not okay anymore. Um Says who? Says who that it's not okay? I think it's okay. Taylor thinks it's okay. Pretty sure Gam thinks it's okay. He's giving a nod. Uh, so who gets to decide what is and isn't okay? And if we don't have free speech in comedy, maybe you have it nowhere. That is like the final, final frontier as far as as far as free speech goes. Is comedians being able to make jokes about whoever they want to make jokes about right. because it is exactly that a joke and if you can't take a joke don't listen to the comedian it's really as simple as that i'll see these like stand-up videos on on tiktok and in youtube where hecklers start screaming at comedians for being offensive why did you show up do you know it's what comedy, comedy is yeah. it's literally comedy it's yeah. literally a joke what do you think about the the idea that the people people and were angry that the dixie chicks didn't support the war on terror so they uh, burn their CDs. Is that an example of cancel culture? I don't, I wouldn't say that's an example of cancel culture. I think it's very much like what we talk about when it comes to voting with your wallet, how, you know, we're not going to buy from Ulta Beauty anymore because right. they have two biological men doing a podcast about girlhood. So I'm not going to go there anymore. I shouldn't have said we, I don't think you guys shop at <laughs> Ulta, um, but I'm not going to be shopping there anymore. So that's a little different. Right, but be... you're a consumer deciding not to use their product. It's, it's right. not the same as, I don't know that there were, if there were petitions of people saying, Hey, uh, to their record label you can't carry their cds or walmart you can't sell their cds anymore i'm guessing that was a time when we were still on cds sure. um but you know that that would be more in the realm of cancel culture if spotify yanked their music over their comments or over their opinions that would be like the right. in, something that's more enforced i don't think that just people saying i don't like something you said so i'm not going to listen to your music anymore it's not necessarily the same thing yeah it's going to be like a fine it's going to be a fine line there because so it depends because you have these these platforms who can do that very same thing and you go well it's a private business they get to do whatever they want and that is true but then you have to get into the section 230 debate and whether or not they benefit from being able to do what whatever it is they want without policing certain things and and being uh being super strict on others so it's it's a nuanced thing to get into uh if a private company didn't like what the Dix dixie chick said and they said you're not going to be able to record in our studio anymore yeah. is that cancel culture no, you that, know what i mean no, but the energy saying that this this sh you should be eliminated from public like being a part of Exactly. The public sphere. Exactly. That you that's to me the cancel culture. I agree. And people at that time, I don't think were and I mean I don't remember the freaking Dixie Chicks example, but I don't remember this I'm saying all that there is a distinction there of like somebody choosing no longer to use your product is not the same thing as this whole PC mob coming mm -hmm. after you and saying you should be deplatformed, you shouldn't be allowed to be in public anymore, no one should yeah. be able to go to your concerts, your sponsors should abandon you. That's cancel culture. That is. And it's just like it's like these videos that you get of the quote Karens on the internet and then somebody doxes them and finds their job and suddenly the the job is getting 50 calls a day about how this woman needs to be fired and the job might not even be aware of the video on the internet but they're just getting inundated with so many people talking to them that they go oh, I've got to fire Karen. I don't know what you what you're going to do. You're going to keep calling me. So I, there's obviously different levels to uh, how this plays out and how it affects people, which I'm I'm hoping they're going to get into and talk about. So you can say whatever you want, but you need to be also be ready for like the repercussions of what you say. Okay, you're not free to say whatever you, you want. If you get fired you for an off color exactly. joke. Um, I... All across the country, oh, hey. clinics not that provide this man. <laughs> are being. Not this man. That's not the man you want to see okay. when talking about something like this. Okay, let's continue. You feel well, when I, it's you who well, is out of step with the social mores. Okay, of the and day. then you get the repercussions of what you said. I think you're you're still acting like this is something new, though. People have been. Fired I, well, I'm not. For things, but two people, wrongs don't make a right. People though. have been fired for things that they've said for forever. But now we're seeing it, an era where if you're disrespectful or bigoted towards someone, you get. Dude, it's not the same. Like, look at the level at which these things are happening. Look at how often we're having these conversations and look at how minuscule the offenses are that people get totally canceled for. I mean, we're talking, you said a sentence on a podcast 13 years ago. Now you're not working uh, on Jeopardy anymore, which is what happened to that Jeopardy host. Forget what his name is. There's just so many people. The names Ken are just Jennings? all over. Not Ken Jennings, no. Ken Jennings is one of the, the oh. highest winners on, on Jeopardy. It's Chris, I don't know. Whatever. Whatever. It's something like that. Uh, but yeah. fired. 
It's, and it's, that's it's, what we're talking about. In the same lo- uh, words that we started this with, the catastrophization or, yep. and the overgeneralization. It's this this thing, one thing that you said puts you in this category of people that are unacceptable. And that's a catast- that's an overgeneralization yep. because I can fully read into your motives and, uh, and place you in that category. And then, it, yeah, it's a catastrophization because this one little thing is indicative of all of your views and it puts you in this extreme category. And there is no reference to progress whatsoever. Like, we'll, you'll find a clip of me, I don't know. I say, you'll, if you find something of me saying something when I'm eight years old, they're like, well, you must be the same person you were when you were eight years old and you haven't progressed a day since you were eight years old. That's truly how they view people. And the people who support cancel culture, like I'm assuming Victoria does with what she's saying, are saying, oh, well, it's for progress. It's for changing the world. It's for creating you know, an alternative, a, a something better for, for people where they're not offended as much and they feel safer. Is it really about progress? If you're, you're, you're viewing me as the same person I was 13 years ago? No, it's not. It's really not about progress at all. Get fired for that. I don't see that as a bad thing. But it's a lot more that's been caught up. The point is, the threshold has really gotten low. Doctor Phil is like "Mm." much more. What do you want to say? I think that I don't think we're fragile. I don't think Generation Z is fragile. I don't think they're fragile at all. Are they they more sensitive about things? That could be argued. We could be discussed that. What? (laughs) I don't think they're fragile. But are they more fragile? We could discuss that. Is basically what she just. Yeah. What's the distinction between fragile and sensitive in this context? I'm not. Uh, sure. There's very little to none. But I also think part of that sensitivity, we're just seeing it more because you're out there on social media more. Right. So we're seeing more of who you are. And I think I think that's a great thing. There's a point to that. Um, you know, a Generation Z, they are going to be 30% of the workforce in less than 10 years. So the fact that they want to talk about mental health, they want to talk, want to freely express how they feel, if they don't like what somebody has to say, we just can't discount that because they are going to be a big part of the workforce. They're gonna be you know, the future politicians, the future CEOs. Right. So understanding them and giving them a solid foundation to move forward, move on, that's important. I feel like we're just wanting to be heard. And I don't think that there's necessarily anything wrong. I don't think that that makes us fragile. I just think we wanna be heard. I do. Th- <laughs> I, I think you can you can say, and she made the argument that because we're on social media and our faces and our lives are broadcast to the world, we're just seeing people's personal lives more, and that's what makes us think we're more sensitive. But let's, and that's that could be a valid point, and that's something to understand. And social media does incentivize sensitivity and vulnerability and crying and all of these things. But let's look at markers outside of just saying that's the reason that this is happening. Look at how many young people are going to therapy. Look at how many people say they have depression, anxiety, antisocial disorder, uh, BPD, all of these different things that they are now uh, personally struggling with. Look at how many young people are cutting themselves. Look at how many young people are attempting suicide. Look at how many young people are successfully committing suicide. These are all markers that you could use to address, hey, are we seeing an uptick in these sorts of problems rather than saying, oh, they're just on social media and you just see more of it. And that's the explanation. Yeah. And I can't help but think of uh, what Dr. Lukianoff, it's hard to say his name, Lukianoff. but he started with saying like I, my, my book, The Coddling of American Mind is unfortunately titled. He wishes it was called The uh, Disempowerment of the American Mind. And it is it is disempowering to have that fragility and that victim mentality. Mm-hmm. And it's if, if the way that you see the world and see yourself is, isn't empowering you to uh, deal with standard things that everyone has to deal with in life and contend with reality itself. Like reality is not this oppressive thing that you need to be rebelling and being an activist against. It's reality. And yeah. if you're not, if your worldview is not preparing you for that, then there are issues with it and it is subject to criticism. That doesn't mean that everything that came before you was right, that, that boomers and their excesses were justified or that millennials have it all right. But it is like a thing that we can acknowledge that this hypersensitivity is not preparing you for uh, for success and being resilient and being strong in life. And you think about that old quote, uh, a strong men create good times, good times create weak men, weak men create, and you get meek people, yeah. <laughs> or weak people create bad times, and then bad times create strong men. And, and, yep. and, so, and we're definitely in the cycle, if you look at that generationally, uh, where are we on that? You answered right. to me, I, you know. And it does carry out, you know, when he talks about how universities are just making people so unready for the world, that's exactly what's happening. If I, me, 
If I'm showing up to a university and professors and students are feeling the need to take the day off, you don't get to do that in the real world. You don't get to do that when you go and get a job and a customer comes in that you don't like. You don't get to say I'm taking the day off of work because this customer does not support the values that I that I share in my own personal life. That is not a privilege that is extended to you in the real world. But what we're going to see now is either A, Gen Z people entering into the real world and getting fired from their jobs for this sort of behavior, or B, what we are also seeing, corporations caving to loud, just tantrum culture Gen Z employees who are speaking loud enough and making enough of a fuss that it makes them uncomfortable to really, I would I would only want to say be authoritarian, but really bring down the rules and say, no, I hired you for this. This is what you're supposed to do. And I don't want to hear about your your personal beliefs outside of the job that I've hired you to do. Like, look at Twitter and all the employees who said, well, if you if Elon Musk buys this company, I'm going to quit and I'm not going to be here anymore. Or I'm going to start uh, a major problem within the diversity and equity and inclusion department and all these different things. And that's fine if you want to quit, like do that. But you don't get to just bring your personal beliefs into work and go, well, I don't like the person who bought this company. So now I'm going to make it a problem for you. Okay, bye. Yeah, it, this whole mentality sets the table toward authoritarianism. Like, I think this yep. this idea that it's progressive to have one acceptable way of viewing things and then consolidate power around that, consolidate cultural power, institutional power around that, and then shame and bully everyone who dissents into agreeing with what is the acceptable, politically correct narrative. That is that is sets the table for totalitarianism and that is where we seem to be in our culture and i think the uh the world is not a safe space and mm -hmm. uh, i think back to where we were just at winona state and you know the students had to have classes canceled for the day or professors yeah. canceled class yeah. for the day because a speaker with whom they disagree, who espouses ideas of, hey, you should be a critical thinker. Hey, you should be exposed to other ideas that you disagree with and make your points and, and use logic and uh, be open to free inquiry at an academic institution. What a concept. Don't um, get and, that, yeah. But no, we're canceling classes. And it's like that is not equipping people for reality. It's not yeah. equipping people for real life. And either the society caves to this sort of behavior yep. or you get somebody who's going to bring down the hammer and they're going to bring down the hammer hard and you are not going to like it. Anyways, let's keep going. I think we've taken it a little bit too far because in past generations, you know, mental health, therapy, these things were stigmatized and that literally got people killed. They didn't get the care they yep. need. But nowadays, it's almost so far to the other extreme that it can be trendy or cool or get you attention to have a disorder, to have something. We've literally seen massive TikTokers busted for faking different mental illnesses. That's when you know you're valorizing the wrong thing. Yeah. But I don't think that that affects the general Gen Z masses that are going on TikTok and having their feelings hurt. If you hurt my feelings and I post a video that my feelings are hurt and I see Gen Zers caring and then there's that one person that's like, oh, get over it. Okay, that's fine. But it's like, I feel like my generation has more people just being like, you know what, like this did hurt my feelings. So. Oh, I, do I want to make the, I don't know if I want to make the comment. It's just like, you know, when you argue something and you're just giving just a clearly valid, just concise point, and then somebody just runs off uh, into a whole nother field and is talking about something totally different that is not at all what you were talking about. And it could just be the editing of this episode uh, that is making this seem out of sync. But that's what just happened there. And yeah, I mean, in, in debate, you call that a red herring. Yeah. Just throwing something out there that's uh, and look, and, I, you know, I'm no I, I have nothing against this guy. I don't want to like knock him for sharing his feelings. And that's how he felt in that moment and, and articulate it. And that's great. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's kind of like I mean, this was a problem we ran into when we were at Dr. Phil. It was just like it's happening so fast and like stuff just happening right. and people just came with a prepared talking point and say their talking point or just they can take the conversation or whatever. So yeah. anyway, but yeah, this does feel like off track, like Brad made a really great point <laughs> and it's like. Well, my response is, here's how I feel about, you know, I, people hurting my feelings on TikTok. It's clear that one side is stacked with research and, and studies that proves exactly what they're saying. And the other side is stacked with feelings. <laughs> that's all. That's very clear. Oh, I don't know. I don't think, I, I don't think there's anything better than giving your feelings a voice. Uh, we are on TikTok. We're the baby boomers and we have followers and you're absolutely right. We have a lot of people, younger people, that come to us as we're mother figures, this and that. However, what I really have seen is a lot of ageism, which I'm not used to that. Oh, uh, our computer loves to keep yeah. going out. 
Wonderful. We're collecting um, your super chats, by the way, guys. So if you're dropping those in the chat, we all we will answer on the end of the show. So thank you. Okay, we're gonna get back to this. And it comes from a younger generation of people that are saying, "Go back to Facebook." You know, um, right. you know, we shouldn't be on calling us grandmas. None of us are grandmothers. Um, you know, things like that, which I was surprised at, just because. The younger generation I heard was all inclusive. Right. And so I thought, oh, we're going to be welcomed. And it was really interesting to find that we really have to talk our way through things. Mm -hmm. And we learned how to block people. So, <laughs> so she said, let me learn how to block. <laughs> um, you know, you can make the interesting thing is I, I often really don't like having these conversations through the lens of a generation because there is so much like you can't just generalize a whole group of people simply right. because we were they were all born around the same time. Like you're going to go on the Internet as an older person and find a bunch of probably really shitty Gen Z people who are going to say, OK, boomer and get off the Internet and all this different stuff. But you're also going to find Gen Z people who are totally chill and fine. So it's hard to make these sweeping generalizations, but also you do have to look at trends and there are some clear trends among people in our age group. Right. We can always give the disclaimer that there there are fragile boomers and millennials and right. there are very logical and, right. you know, rational, critical thinking Gen Zers. Mm -hmm. I've met one. I've met one or two. <laughs> We've seen them around. I feel like some of my Gen Z, um, you know, fellow people, they might not be the nicest, but that doesn't mean we're all mean. Like, I feel no. like okay. if I would have saw that on my like, page, that I wouldn't have wrote, and I, I would have liked it. I'm like, Slay. Like, <laughs> like, Thank you. So I, just, I really just feel like some people may not be the nicest, and I love that you learned the block button. <laughs> I really, honestly, I don't block as many because I'm like, whatever, they're going to talk about me. But I yeah. definitely feel like the block button's there for a reason, and some people are just rude. What do you guys think about this younger generation and how they work, don't work, move around job-wise, what they expect? Uh huh. Well, I don't like stereotypes of any kind. I think there are ambitious, industrious people in your generation, there were in our generation, there were also deadbeats. Um, it's just a very, um, you know, it's so individual. They right? seem but to want trends. to focus on their phones more than listening and learning. So it's frustrating for me sometimes. Again, not generalizing that all students are like that, but a lot of them are on their phones while I'm talking. And are I say, failing? if you need to talk on your phone, you can go outside and talk on your phone. Are they failing? No, because of grade inflation. Hmm. Grade inflation scares me. What, what is great inflation? They all expect they, to get A's, no matter what. But years ago, uh, it wasn't like that. Dude, which is literally happening, and uh, they might not revisit this subject matter, but, like, the the governor of Oregon lowered the... the uh, academic standing you need in, in math, in reading, in writing, in science for students just to make sure that they all graduated. So essentially we're going, oh, our students are not equipped for the real world. Let's just lie to them and tell them that they are and we'll send them on the other way. Same thing we're doing with black students with affirmative action going, you're not meeting the academic standards of our school, but let me just lie to you and say that you are and then we'll put you in there and then when you fail, oh, we'll lie to you again and then you graduate and then you go to the real world and then you're not ready. Oh, well, we'll lie to you again and we'll hire you. It's just a, a cyclical lies and lies and lies and lies. And like we can we can obviously say judge everybody on an individual basis. But look at trends with this generation. It's it's unbelievable. You have teachers just flying out of schools right now uh, because they're not being treated properly. Some of it's overpay, but a lot of it is just the kids. They're like, the kids are not listening to me. They don't want to learn. I don't know what we're going to do yeah. here. Yeah, and we I've talked about we want to do an episode on like why are so many teachers quitting this generation because there's yeah. a lot of these videos that are surfacing on TikTok and YouTube of teachers just being like I couldn't handle it anymore. My wife's a former teacher, she left it. But um so speaking of trends, like you need to look no further than falling test scores in, in current times and how far behind the US is lagging behind other countries in mm -hmm. academic outcomes and performance and uh it's no wonder, too, that science and STEM fields are being overtaken by activists because people are graduating with participation trophies yep. um, and and uh, entering into the field with that rather than being qualified and being prepared yeah. in a, to compete in a competitive world. And the, the world that is not going down these woke rabbit holes and more concerned about DEI than science and academic outcomes is leaving us in the dust. Yeah, and it'll be something to look into because they're talking about work trends here. I haven't really done a lot of research into the work trends of different generations. But what I'm seeing with my eyes is, you know, after COVID, look at how many people just decided 
you know, I was pretty cool being home all day and I don't think I'm going to actually return to work. I don't know what the generational breakdown of that is, but I would imagine that it skews young and uh, we'll have to look and, and confirm that. There's this whole idea of, of quiet quitting where, where young people are saying, you know what, I'm only going to do the basic tenets of what I was hired to do here or, or less than that, the very bare minimum, because uh, according to them, that's all they get paid for is the bare minimum. There's no idea that maybe I should stay a little bit later and work a little harder to see if I can move up. Maybe I should take on an extra project to prove uh, that I can move up in the hierarchy that is this this job. And there there can be benefits to that. You know, if you are a young person who has the mindset of, you know, I want to have a life that's shaped less around work and more around leisure, which a lot of young people and older people have, uh, you know, a propensity to believe put in the work so you can have a life like that, but they don't want to put in the work. There's this idea that I shouldn't have to give anything of myself in order to achieve the things that other people have achieved. And they're looking up at these elites and these celebrities and these social media influencers and going, I want to be that. It's like what one in four Gen Zers want to be a, a social media influencer. And this is coming from somebody who does it for a living. <laughs> and they go, I want to be, luckily I, I do it in politics, but I don't even think that's an excuse. I still do social media day in and day out. So they're, they're looking up and going, that's what I want to be. And I, you know, if I'm being honest, it's like it's like a guy who lives in his mom's basement eating pizza rolls like like TV Taylor on Dr. Phil does. <laughs> and he's like, why don't I get hot girls? It's the very same approach that Jordan Peterson has to incels. It's like, what are what do you have that girls want? What do you have that warrants you being a social media influencer? What do you have that warrants you living this elite w lifestyle without putting any work in? But we just expect it. Yeah. And. America, so many people came to America because it was the place where there weren't barriers in place for you to bet on yourself, for you to create value within yourself or create something of value that you can put out into the market and build a business or do some, make something of yourself, mm -hmm. no matter where you came from, no matter what your background is, there's not all these artificial barriers. And that, that is the idea Then you know, and we have, of course we haven't always lived up to that. We can talk about that, but that is what people come here for is that the land of opportunity, the American dream. And where we've got, it's, it's become fleetly completely flipped on its head now to where the American dream is I sit back and just am handed things from the government rather yeah. than I want the government out of the way so I can achieve my dreams and become what I want to be or create something valuable or right. build myself into something it's it's none of that it's I want to you know I want people to watch me play video games all day and then I mean whatever if that's a career choice that you can create value at and entertain sure. people then great but you know what I mean like it's it, the social media star the fact that they want to be that it's like <sighs> We yeah. have a long way to go. It's to a back. sense of entitlement and it's a lack of reality. Like one in yeah. four people cannot be social media influencers. That is simply that is simply the case. Now you can be that person who hustles and strives and works every day. And actually, and if you're like, you know what? I want to be a social media influencer so bad that I'm going to work every single day of my life to make content and, and be there and be the person who's so consistent that I make it. And you know what? If that's what you choose to do, I applaud it. But it's like these people who are like, you know what? I'm going to post a picture of my acai bowl and I'm expect <laughs> to be a social media influencer tomorrow. And it's just not how it works. You just don't get things without putting work in. No, you don't. And sometimes you do put the work in and it still doesn't happen. And yep. that's, a, but that, you know what, that's too. something called reality. And you have to have a, a, a deeper sense of self and meaning and purpose and orientation in the world. You have to have a little bit of wisdom and be able mm -hmm. to see, okay, this, you know, I'm, uh, I'm six foot one, but I probably can't play in the NBA because I didn't start training when I was a child and I'm not good enough to overcome that lack of mm -hmm. height that you probably need. Um, and ditto for beach volleyball. That's my favorite sport. I would love to be a professional beach volleyball player. What a great lifestyle. But I don't have the skill to get there and I have to acknowledge that. And and anyways, yeah, the idea, you have to keep in mind that you you pursuing your dreams should come with a grain of salt. And that's just like general wisdom in life that you, you make the best life that you can with the cards that you're dealt and uh, you'll you find meaning in uh, in more than just this fanciful dream sometimes. Yeah, and I will say, I am all for it. Like Taylor and I will talk about this and we'll see these young people who make TikTok videos about like, I don't understand why every single day we're expected to work and and oh, uh, we are, we are 
living to work instead of working to live, I think is the, the phrase that people use. And Taylor's like, they need to get up and get, go to work. And, <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? I understand wanting a little bit more leisure time. I understand yeah. that America is a particularly unique country in that we truly have a rat race when it comes to working and it comes to our capitalist system. It is not like, like if you go to to Paris or, or someplace uh, in Western Europe and you walk around, it's like, oh, you guys are actually chilling and you guys don't work all the time and you guys always have Sunday off and just like different things like that. And it's a different form of society. So I think people ex experience that or hear that and they go, well, why am I here? I have to work every single day. And I think a, a lack of passion and meaning is also something that feeds into that. Because if you're in America and you have passion and meaning, you want to work every day. Like you want to hustle for the things that, that you want because America's really one of the only places where you can build to the furthest extent of yourself. Yeah. You know, whatever it is that you put in, in America, you, you can go unlimited. So there are people who value that. People who immigrate here legally tend to really, really value that and say, you know, and even people who immigrate here I illegally uh, uh, can even value that and want to work as hard as possible to put in everything they can to get as much out of it. Whereas you can't do that in other countries, but it's about a choice there. Yeah, and I'm reminded of Dennis Prager. He says freedom is uh, as a value, not an instinct. And people generally would rather be taken care of than have to fend for themselves, bet on themselves and assert themselves and, yeah. and, and uh, build the life that they want. You'd yeah. rather... So, and but that is an freedom is an American value, generally speaking, or it was. And that I think this conversation around Gen Z is like, are we are we losing that? Are we shifting to a people in a culture that would prefer to be taken care of um, from the the want the the culture and the values that are like, hey, this is land of opportunity. I'm going to bet on myself. I don't want anything handed to me. Mm -hmm. I want everything out of my way, and I want to go go for it. Yeah. And you know, obviously. I'm speaking as an American of somebody who, uh, I mean, they're still Americans if you disagree with that and, and you want us to be a more taken care of type of culture. But uh, I, I'm speaking as someone who tradition uh, appreciates that tradition and wants to see it persist. Yeah. And so I'm those are my cards on the table. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm curious to see because I think there's going to be like a, a major, a major workforce shift, of course, of just people working remotely, people owning their own social media type businesses. It's been one of the truly amazing things, despite all the negatives about TikTok, is watching how many people get all of their income off of this app, whether it be small business owners who are like making candles or candy and all this different stuff and selling it to people, models, uh, it's comedians, it's uh, people who vlog their daily lives. It's amazing to see how overnight somebody can just start getting their lifetimes income on an app like this. And if these things continue to grow and this becomes a field that virtually everybody in some way, shape or form has their toe dipped in, uh, you know, the whole workforce could shift, which is going to be wild to see. It is and it is, you know, when, when we hear the term like one fourth of Gen Zers want to be social media influencers, that sounds crazy. But I imagine a big, a big portion of those people really could be, really could be uh, yeah. with just how inflated social media is which yeah. is wild my favorite are the ones who make a great living by working very hard at creating content and going online complaining about how they shouldn't have to work <laughs> and and how bad our culture is yeah. and how bad capitalism is very that's true. my those are my favorites who are like multi-millionaires living in beverly hills <laughs> uh, <laughs> who, um, yeah, who got famous off of sorry capitalism. cough i had a really big cough there um anyways guys <laughs> uh let me know your thoughts in the chat down below we are going to get into some super chats today let's go ahead and read them if i didn't get some uh i'm sure taylor or cam hopefully has them uh, man man kayla i hope i said your your name right Thank you for your super chat. Is it true Gen Z is more conservative than previous generations since the greatest generation? But same time, it is more liberal slash leftist slash woke. If that is true, then it has two main parts. I I don't remember the last time I looked at numbers on uh, whether or not uh, Gen Z is more conservative. I imagine the way it's going to be skewed if we are more conservative is because men, uh, Gen Z boys and men are far more conservative than their female counterparts. I think we we did uh, we did an article about how like forty percent of of young women are just like strongly liberal, and oh, yeah. compared to like a very small percentage of of young men. So if if Gen Z has a conservative leaning, it's because of the men. The men. Yeah, yeah, I that's mean, all that I know. based on the study that we we talked about last week, if the women young if young women are getting more 
liberal and young men are staying the same. Yeah. And in theory, no, Gen Z is getting more Right, liberal. right, with time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I, I haven't heard the, an argument. I mean, I guess I'm just with how they identify or how they vote is is where the, the idea that Gen Z is more conservative yeah. comes in because I definitely don't see it when I look out at Gen Z influencers and <laughs> right, stuff. Right, it's hard. Know? But, you know, I'll go on TikTok and see people who are just overtly super woke and lefty and you read the comments and it's a bunch of Gen Z people being like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> you went too far. You know, I get, I get the whole acceptance thing and like being chill with everybody, but you went too far. So I think there's a little bit of that too. Just we we came out of the gate a little bit too strong with trying to normalize this stuff, and people are going, "Whoa!" I said I said you know LGB was cool. <laughs> I don't <laughs> know about all the now. other stuff. If you're, yeah, if you're just gay, the whole movement left you in the dust at this yeah, point. Yeah, they really did. They Rubin really did. About. Uh, this next one is from Steve Smith. I think people will be canceled in air quotes or sued in not far future for being racist to white people. Just saying people just saying, please look into Australia changing constitution to put race into it. I haven't seen that, but uh, I don't know. But this does remind me of your comments on a few of the podcasts you've been on lately when you mm -hmm. said that. If, if things continue as they are with the double standards that have been in place, we are going to see like a civil rights movement for white people. Straight up, dude. Y'all are being discriminated against in uh, jobs. You're being discriminated against at college. You're being discriminated against online with your businesses, with government loans and funding and all this different stuff. If this is not a violation of the Civil Rights Act, I don't know what is. So uh, that's I feel like that's going to make it to the Supreme Court. It already is with colleges and Ivy Leagues because Asian people are suing it's not because of white people yet but asian asian students are suing uh, i mean just like equal protection under the law that's going to come into uh, come into question here there's so many different things that again if we stay on this trajectory like oh yeah we are gonna have a civil rights movement for white people which would just be the funniest thing i ever like imagine going like turning on fox news and they're like it is now day 19 of the protest led by the civil rights movement for white people <laughs> The police have come out with their fire hoses. It's just like, imagine, mm -hmm. imagine if we just revert all the way back to the 1960s, but for white people. Yeah, do a sit in at Yale University admissions or something. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Horrifying to think about. I hope it doesn't get that far to where that needs to be something that happens, but it truly does feel like it. We're at least in the space of having a mini civil rights movement for white people. Already. It's just, it's tough being a victim, Amala. It's, you have, it's no, you have no idea how impressed we are. <laughs> you have to read this name, as always. Oh, Paulo Eduardo de Santos Arienchi. <laughs> Thank you for your consistent super chats, because everybody yeah, gets to consistently yeah. learn that Taylor <laughs> speaks Portuguese. Muito obrigado. Uh, here's me on collectivism again. Progress towards what and who defines that? And who said that everyone wants to go the same direction? One needs to think about it for two seconds to see the problem. Exactly, exactly. And that's why this idea of free speech is so wonderful and liberating is because it's not limiting. Because as soon as you try to limit something, you'll learn just how impossible it actually is to come to a collectivist decision about what to limit, how to limit it, and what that looks like. It is just unbelievable. And that's why uh, equality of outcome makes absolutely no sense because you have no idea how much bureaucracy and red tape it takes to have everybody's outcome be equal. And all that means is a big government. A big government that is hindering you from growing and, and branching out. And people, if you just took a, a couple seconds to think about how you would achieve it. Well, they'll get it right this time. Yeah. No one else in history has ever really figured it out. You know, they, it's they our were turn. close, but it's real, our you know, turn. Yeah, the real utopia has never been achieved. You gotta, I, I just got to add, uh, you're, you don't progress past a system that lets people be free and prosper. Yeah. And, it's always regression. Yeah. And so any anything that you're trying to add to that or, you know, I mean, we got to hold it in balance. And, yeah, we have to, like, refine. And like you were saying before, we have to, you know, uh, throw out the bathwater, but keep the baby yes. Uh, yes. with each generation. And uh, this whole idea that we need to progress past free speech and progress past all the wealth creating uh, joy <laughs> that uh, that uh, the America has brought is just nuts to me. It's not saying it's perfect, but it's right. just saying. You, your ideas are purely theoretical. Nothing's ever good has ever come out of them. Right. And uh, to, to say that that's progress is just 
I'm not buying it. Yeah, it's just there's room for progressivism in every single society. In fact, it's a necessity. Mm -hmm. it, it is a necessity to have people that are looking and searching for problems and then trying to find better ways to to go about these issues. But we've gone too far. And our definition of what is a problem, like the threshold is so low. And and that is really the problem. I think it's like Tom Soul said, you know, meteorologists used to be the only profession where you could get on TV and lie and still get paid and now everybody gets to do it and intellectuals get to do it and you you never have to face the actual consequences of the things you advocate for you know if an architect creates a building and the building crumbles to the ground that architect's going to have uh, his day to to see the results of his actions and face the results of his actions if an intellectual puts out a bad idea and suddenly it's implemented all across society and society crumbles, that intellectual never has to face what they've done. And that's what we're, everybody's an intellectual these days and everybody's putting out these problems that are literally crumbling our society. Yeah. And so that's fun. <laughs> meanwhile, uh, yeah, Dylan Mulvaney is consulting our, the highest levels of our government on women's issues. <laughs> so who's going to face the consequences of that? Hopefully Biden was just too <laughs> in, entrenched in his chocolate chocolate chip ice cream to hear anything about trans children and you know He probably got like a billion trillion 25 million ideas out of that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we're going to move on to some more Super Chats here. <clears throat> Elif, I hope you said your name right. Thank you for your Super Chat. Hey, Amla, love you and your energy. Keep doing the Lord's work. That's all. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, you couldn't shut me up if you tried. So <laughs> we're, we're here all week, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Gina Leon, uh, no no message, but thank you so much for your Super Chat. Appreciate it. Uh, Luis Reyes Chavez says, besides the bomb obvious, Ooh, the bomb Amala, obviously, who is a role model you recommend listening to in today's age of sensitivity that grounds us in reality, hard work, and free thinking? Tom Soul. That's why we got him on the podcast. He's always looking over our shoulder to make sure that we're keeping our integrity and saying uh, things in, in, in truth, hopefully. Yeah. We might slip up every now and then, but Tommy <laughs> Boy Tommy keeps rarely does. <laughs> Do you have, you have a role model? Uh, I mean... Tom Soul is tough to beat, especially like he's not like as he should be viral and popular in the same way that that so, really so many others be. are right now. And but and it's and his wisdom really is timeless. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, you, you, Jordan Peterson's a great person to listen to. Yeah. Um, and he's definitely like especially for this generation that has lost sight of a lot of why traditionalism has any value and why you, know, what you can learn anything from the past or mythology or anything like that. He's got uh, a lot speak to there that can really help your life so that's someone i would recommend cam, cam do you have, do you have any role models you'd recommend um yeah i don't know when i think of like especially in terms of like people that you see in content all the time that i would want to be the most like jordan peterson is probably the first person that comes to mind for mm -hmm. me so yeah yeah I, which obviously because he's everywhere and he's helped so many people with with the things he said just opening their eyes for a second which is what truth and just a calm temperament typically can do uh, next one from chance haley thank you for your super chat social influence stands at a crossroads true success if the mentality of the influencers are corrupted and by their own particular influences we need a separation of objective truths and, ide and ideals i think what you're you're saying there is that obviously influencers especially when what they're searching for as far as income is really not money, but just influence over other people can easily become corrupted by either their own ideas and agenda and what they're trying to push or the agenda of the people who pay them to say and do certain things, which is so true and something that obviously we all have to safeguard ourselves from. It was amazing when... I think it was either Dixie or Charlie D'Amelio, one of those really big TikTok dance girls who, when the whole George Floyd thing happened, like made this whole BLM post and all the TikTokers started doing it and the black square this and black square that. It's crazy how easily just corruption and bad ideas just spreads due to social influence. Yeah, we talked earlier about the um, Hollywood making the Imagine video after the uh, BLM like riots. Imagine this. <laughs> Oh, so cringe. Yeah, we watched that Joe Rogan. We got to react to that whole clip. But he, but he was like, all these celebrities came out and were like, I will no longer stand for racism. And he's like, what racism were you standing for before? <laughs> it's amazing. <clears throat> yeah, no, in lockstep. It's almost, it's insane. Yeah, we are going to do a whole separate video about Hollywood and LA and all this different stuff because it's crazy how easily people just fall into the trap of what they're trying to search for in whatever it is they're trying to search for in this city and in this space. From Glenn Haywood, no message but thank you so much for your super chat we really appreciate it and that's it 
for Super Chats on today's show. Guys, I'm curious to get your thoughts in the comments after we end the show today. Uh, how do you feel about Gen Z? Are, are we a more sensitive generation? Do you think you, you're seeing that on social media? Or are we not a more sensitive generation and we're just a generation that's facing the traumas and the problems that other generations have been too preoccupied with other things to face? Let me know in the comments down below. And I think it can be a little bit of a mixture of both. Like I said, there's room for progress in every single society, but have we gone too far with our uh, progression? <laughs> I don't even know if I want to call it that, you know? It, it, seems, it sounds so positive. Have we become so open-minded our brains fail out? Yeah, brother. <laughs> I like that on Facebook. <laughs> but one more super, late bloomer super chat just oh, came love in. It. Steve, okay. Well, it's Steve Smith. He did another one earlier, right? Thanks, Steve Smith. Yes. I, he's got the Australian dollars coming in. He says, Amala <laughs> is cool and the guy too. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Which guy? Is it Cam or Taylor? Probably Cam. It's <laughs> Let's be honest. Taylor. I've been giving my boomer millennial takes over here. So oh, that is probably the... making everyone mad. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it for today's show, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Taylor's got to book it over to the Dude Ranch, uh, so he's got a place to be. Cam's got to go. I don't know. Party? What do you What do you got to do, Cam? Uh, I don't know. Probably edit your videos. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cam's got to go work. Uh, so <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys have a fantastic fantastic weekend. Please like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single time we go live. That is Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. And I realize you guys aren't turning on your notification bells. What's wrong with me? Tell me in the comments and I'll cry about it because I'm a sensitive Gen Zer. <laughs> also, if you'd like to talk with me uh, over the weekend, I'll be on Discord, our Discord server. You can join that by going to the link in the description down below. Logging in, putting a ticket, opening the ticket, okay guys? Sending a message with your email after you open the ticket because a lot of people were having trouble figuring this out and I get it, it was confusing. I just learned what Discord was like a week ago. So send your email <laughs> and a message, send it to us and we will let you in the Discord server to talk with all the other thousands of people that are now there to uh, to communicate. Do you have to, are you gonna go in there now after? To say hello I to the I think I will, if, if they're doing a live channel, I'll be in the Discord right, we'll come right crash after the, the watch show. Party. Yeah, so thank you guys so much. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you Monday. Peace.